I think the coolest thing is that moment where you get a confusing result. And this has happened quite a number of times. And the reason it's so cool is because unlike when you get a result that you expect, which has a certain degree of satisfaction, a confusing result is what really makes you think. And it allows you to talk to people in your lab, brainstorm about what's happening, what might be happening. And then all of a sudden, you look back through your old notebooks and a whole series of experiments that never made sense at the time immediately click into place. And that, I think, is, is easily the coolest thing and certainly the most satisfying thing about doing science. My name is Manu Hegde. I'm a group leader at the LMB. Uh, recently, I was uh, appointed joint head of division of the Division of Cell Biology. I trained at UCSF, where I got an MD and a PhD. Then I spent uh, 11 years at the NIH, where I ran a laboratory there. And then about eight and a half years ago, I came to the LMB as a group leader. My lab is interested in uh, two things, how proteins are made and matured to their final functional product, and how the cell recognizes when this process fails and targets the proteins for degradation. I chose an area of research uh, mostly out of accident. So what happened was that uh, I was in medical school, and uh, I was uh, not particularly inspired by the way that medical school was taught, because it's largely memorization, and uh, not about actually figuring out how things work. And so I had asked one of my professors if I could perhaps work in his lab. And uh, he felt that medical students really were useless in the lab and that just it wasn't uh, productive. So what he did was he gave me the name of, an, of a colleague of his who he felt would be uh, amenable to having medical students in the lab. And of course, at the time, uh, you didn't have Google, you couldn't look up what the person did, and so I just left a message on this person's uh, email, uh, on this person's uh, phone machine. And uh, then at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning, he called me back and asked if I was uh, maybe interested in meeting. And fortunately, at the time, I used to live right across the street from UCSF. So I said, I'll be there in about 10 minutes. And uh, then I found out what uh, he did. This, was, this became my uh, graduate mentor, uh, Vishu Lingappa. And uh, that's how I got interested in this area. And I've stayed in the same field ever since. I've had a number of different influences in my scientific career. I think, unlike most people who perhaps have uh, one or two scientific heroes or people they particularly admired that drove them into science, I had a series of people that uh, influenced me along the way. I would say the biggest influence in my scientific career was my PhD mentor. Uh, but at the time, uh, that was the only way that I knew of how to do science. And so uh, other influences were uh, colleagues at UCSF at the time who I got to know. For example, the uh, chair of my thesis committee was someone named Peter Walter, who uh, pursued science in a very different way than my PhD mentor. And I had a collaboration with uh, a friend of mine who was in Ron Vale's lab, which again, I think was very inspiring. And so I would say that as I've progressed through my career, each of these people has inspired me in different ways. For example, my PhD advisor, Vishu, was unbelievably creative, just always had new ideas and interesting things, uh, came to the lab every morning excited. But other people have tremendous focus, just the ability to stay and work with a problem for years before they come to eventually understand it. And so each of these things has had a significant influence on how I uh, arrange my lab and how I currently do research. Once I came to the LMB, I'm not sure that I had a hero or uh, one particular person at the LMB that I admired more than anyone else. I think that for me, uh, I've slowly gotten to know my colleagues here. I didn't, uh, I didn't really know anyone at the LMB before I moved here particularly well. I had known some people uh, through conferences, uh, or had overlapped at, uh, at, uh, uh, during some parts of my training. And so I think the way I would view my interaction with my colleagues is several of them have really influenced the directions that our research has taken since we came here. And this has occurred not because of any direct effect that they've had on our research, but when you come across some new finding and you look around who's around you, if there are people that are working on certain topics, uh, you know that you can go into those areas with the confidence that there will be people to advise you, people to tell you 
what the interesting problems are, what things have already been tried. And I think in, in, within the LMB, we've gotten much more interested in translation and the ribosome. And that uh, comes across because Venki Ramakrishnan is just down the hall in structural studies. Uh, we've gotten more interested in RNA degradation. Uh, Lori Passmore is interested in that topic. Uh, our in-depth investigation of things involved in ubiquitination or quality control certainly was uh, influenced by having David Commander down the hall. I moved to the LMB from the NIH, where I had already established a lab. I had been uh, at the NIH for 11 years, and I was already tenured, and so I had absolutely no intention of ever leaving the NIH. In fact, I had more or less picked out where I was going to retire, uh, and at that time, I got a completely random email from one of my colleagues at, uh, at the LMB, Ben Nichols, who I happened to have known about 10 years back. And uh, Ben asked if I, there was any chance I would ever consider moving. And this just seemed a very unlikely possibility. But uh, what happened was that I agreed to come and visit and give a seminar. And the moment I came to the LMB and looked to see what kind of place it was, it just seemed like a, a perfect fit. Uh, there are a lot of things about it that, uh, that uh, attracted me immediately. One was it was a very compact place. So this was the old building. Uh, it was uh, uh, everybody was on top of each other. Everybody talked to each other all day. Uh, and then on my schedule, there were a couple of funny things on the schedule. One was coffee with so-and-so or tea with so-and-so. And I thought this was just um, some type of British way of doing things. But sure enough, at 10 o'clock, we went up to have coffee in the canteen. And I think that was my first experience with the canteen, where you see uh, you know, a large proportion of the building is there talking to each other. Uh, the discussions range widely from, uh, of course, pop culture to mostly science. And I think that seeing so many people interacting all the time was very much inspiring for me. I also like the fact that uh, all the groups were rather small. Uh, when I went to go meet with many of the group leaders during the course of my day, uh, many of them were in the lab when I got there. And many of them, you know, we had our chat in the lab. And I think this was extremely attractive to me. There are a number of skills that I think uh, go into making a great scientist. Uh, I think each person has a different set of skills that makes them great. So some people are amazingly technical. They know uh, and have this mindset of being able to invent new methods, uh, build new machines, and really be able to push the boundaries, whereas other people are much more conceptual. So I don't think there's one particular formula for being a great scientist, but I think what unifies a large proportion of really outstanding scientists is they have an exceptional nose for how to ask a good question. And there's no doubt that this is a, this is a big challenge uh, in science. I think asking a question that's both uh, uh, deep and uh, has long staying power, uh, but is nevertheless tractable within your scientific lifetime, I think that's a very tough balance to strike. There are a number of things that I did during the course of my career which I probably did correctly, but not knowing that I was doing it right. And I think one of those was um, how I chose a lab. So I chose a lab not because of the topic that the lab was studying. In fact, I chose the lab even before I really understood what they were trying to accomplish. I chose a lab because I just got along so well with the uh, group leader. And uh, it was a fantastic training environment. And I think that early on in one's career, it's important to uh, be able to see how people, how scientists that are more senior than you and established and successful scientists um, go about their daily lives. And I think some people are incredibly transparent. They let you in on how they make decisions, on how they think about problems, how they change their mind, how they admit when they're wrong about something. And I think all of these things are important to learn uh, early on. And so uh, I was incredibly lucky to have uh, chosen on that basis instead of on a particular topic that happened to have caught my fancy at that moment in time. There are a number of blind alleys that one can go down in science. And uh, I think these are hard to predict when you first start. So there are a lot of ideas that you first uh, imagine are going to be incredibly productive or inc incredibly interesting. Um, but then it's not until years later that you realize perhaps it wasn't the right time for that idea or the right, uh, um, just the tools didn't exist. And, uh, or, in, or sometimes the idea just turns out to be wrong. And so when I started my lab, 
one of the ideas that I really wanted to pursue was uh, how proteins that get into the endoplasmic reticulum, how that process might be regulated. And uh, this is a process where the basic steps had been understood to some degree at the time, but people didn't really understand how the process might be regulated. And I thought that uh, there might be um, unexpected modes of regulation there. And I think the idea I still really like, but we spent quite a number of years looking into this without really the proper tools to look at it. I think now, with the ability to manipulate things much more precisely, uh, the ability to look at, uh, for example, phosphorylation on a, on a proteome-wide scale, uh, to look at uh, consequences of cells on a proteome-wide scale, we should probably be able to go back to this problem. But I think that that was something where I wish I had thought through the problem more carefully before we actually started. Most of the time I spend, of course, in the lab. Science is what I absolutely love, which is what I've uh, done for many years now. I do, however, occasionally get out of the lab. Uh, I've, I would say that I've never had a single hobby outside of the lab that I've pursued. I tend to be a serial hobbyist. So there are periods of time where uh, I've been incredibly interested in uh, looking at the stars and astronomy, and then uh, that will pass. And then I'll get interested in uh, travel and hiking. Uh, then I'll get interested in photography for some period of time. And so I think that uh, outside of the lab now, the things that I do most probably is I like nature, and I like going to different parts of the world and seeing nature either through hiking or uh, simply just traveling. Um, cooking is another thing that I enjoy doing outside of the lab. When I was growing up, I think uh, I didn't really imagine what a scientific career would look like. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure I really thought that I would be a scientist. There was uh, a lot of pressure to be a doctor. Uh, this is a very common uh, goal for first-generation immigrants. And part of the consequences of that is that I often, when I imagined what I would be doing when I grew up, so to speak, was uh, that I would be a doctor. And uh, I knew that I absolutely loved science. I liked the process of um, figuring out how things worked. But I didn't know what the life of a scientist really was until quite a bit later in my career. And once I was in a lab during graduate school and started to see what uh, uh, scientists around me did all day, I think then I started to get a picture of what my scientific life might be like. I think it's turned out more or less the same as I would have imagined. Although uh, I will say, I think actually being a practicing professional scientist is quite a bit better than seeing how other people do it. Advice for future scientists is always a bit fraught because I think everyone is a bit different and different people respond to different types of advice. For me, I think that it is important to see how other people actually approach science and to take what you see as the best aspects of it uh, away from that. And so for me, I've had, while I've not had any singular mentor throughout my career that I would say uh, was more influential than others, but each person that I look at, you uh, take away from it the things you particularly admire. You know, are they particularly creative? Are they um, incredibly broad thinking? Are they very well read? And you somehow make an amalgam of each of these different things that you admire in different people. And so I think if I were to give advice to somebody just starting, it's to take advantage of the environment that you're in to learn how different people do science and find out which one fits your personality the best. I think that's one of the things that I probably regret during my time at uh, UCSF. During that time in the 1990s, it was probably one of the most exciting places to do science, and I didn't really realize that. I think I wish I would have talked to more people at the time uh, learn more about how they do it. Somehow it seemed that many of my colleagues, uh, in my mind, were just uh, you know, so well known uh, that they were almost un you know, unapproachable. Um, but the reality was, in fact, they weren't. Uh, and I think that that's something that, um, uh, to people just starting out, uh, would be uh, advice that I would give. Predicting the future of science is uh, a challenge, of course. Uh, 
journals try to do this at the end of every year and uh, try to predict what the major breakthroughs will be. I think for me, from where I sit as a biochemist and uh, trying to understand the mechanism of how things work, I think one of the major areas in the next five to 10 years will be to take these fundamental principles of how things work inside of a cell and really try to see how they fit in the context of an incredibly complex organism such as a human. So I think we have uh, many different levels of understanding in terms of physiology, which comes from classical studies in medicine, all the way down to atomic resolution structures. And I think bridging some of these gaps has long been a big challenge. But I think now there are tools to be able to bridge this, whether there are tools in fantastic imaging methods, the ability to make very precise changes in an organism uh, at, at, you know, with much uh, greater ease than was ever possible previously. And so then taking this mechanistic insight and trying to apply it into very complex systems to really try to understand physiology in molecular terms, I think will be a big uh, uh, goal in the next ten, five to 10 years and where I think we'll see a lot of advances.